Hello, everybody. Welcome to ETF Edge, your guide to everything ETFs. I'm your host, Bob Pisani. You know, at a time when rising tension is sweeping the country, interest in investing around social themes, social justice themes in particular, has never been higher. Today, we're going to be discussing one of those ETFs and the concept of ESG, environmental, social, and governance in general here. We're going to guest here, a series of experts in this particular area. Marvin Owens is the senior director over at the NAACP, who will discuss the world's first racially empowering ETF. That's the Impact Shares NAACP Minority Empowerment ETF. I know that's a mouthful, but the symbol is NACP. Joining him, Impact Shares CEO Ethan Powell, uh, as well as Ben Johnson. He is the director of Global Exchange Traded Funds Research over at Morningstar. Uh, Marvin, let me talk with you or start with you. Given us, uh, give us a little bit of background on this particular ETF. It's been around for a couple of years. The assets under management are still pretty small, although they have been growing. Discuss how this was uh, created briefly and what you're trying to accomplish here. Well, thanks for having me. Um, we saw we see this uh, fund as the next evolution of our in our corporate advocacy work around uh, closing the wealth gap for African Americans in this country. Um, the NAACP had been uh, doing corporate scorecards for the last 25, 30 years, uh, in which we would uh, gather data from corporations and score and rank those companies uh, along their commitments to um, uh, hiring in C-suites, uh, supplier diversity, community engagement programs, and the like. And we saw this as an opportunity to really kind of take that advocacy to the next level. It was a wonderful opportunity presented by uh, Rockefeller Foundation and Impact Shares. And we, we wanted to get, get involved with this because it's important that, that corporate America really do, do more than make statements about their commitments to closing the wealth gap and, and ending racial discrimination, but really take steps internally and externally to make sure that's, that's true and it gets lived out in, their, in how they function and operate as businesses. So you've been doing a corporate scorecard. Uh, you mentioned this for 25 or 30 years. Sounds like the NAACP has been doing ESG, a, a sort of ESG is what you're describing, for, for a, a long, long time. How do you feel, Marvin, about uh, how the whole ESG business is evolving? Is it evolving in ways you, you think is the right way to evolve? There's a lot of debate about what goes in these, what the emphasis is on them, for example. Yeah, I think it's a great it's a great point. We have been at it for a long time. The the problem that has existed with ESG is that the S has been very very difficult to define. And that's why an organization like the NAACP with its 111 year history of being advocates for African Americans in this country is the right kind of organi organization to be partnering on this kind of work because we've had the track record in history of doing this work. Um, that's why I think it's going to change in terms of creating some sort of standard, some sort of uh, baseline for folks to understand what does it really mean to work hard to eliminate racial discrimination in a corporate environment. So that's why I think it's important for us to be, have been, been involved in this effort. Yeah. Uh, Ethan, let me turn to you. You were involved in creating this, um, and I want to get to talk a little bit more about what Marvin said about what is in the S and ESG. But you know, what's remarkable to me when I look at this is there again, I see a very heavy emphasis on Amazon as an, uh, an ownership stock, Apple, Microsoft, other big cap names, the Johnson and Johnson's of the world. Um, how do you decide what goes into this kind of fund? What, what decisions go into it? Uh, and why are so many of these ESG funds so similar? Why do they all have the same mega cap names, it seems like? Hey, Bob, no, that's, a, that's a great question. And for us, it's really about evaluating the social and environmental outcomes based off of do you have the right people process and philosophy to accomplish what you're setting out to accomplish. Um, and just as you might pay a sub-advisor for an actively managed financial outcome, in this particular situation, we're paying the NAACP all of our net advisory proceeds to help fund their corporate engagement and to achieve these actively managed social and environmental outcomes. So, um, and then to answer your question, as far as the underlying holdings, we don't pick the holdings, right? So we work with the NAACP to craft what it means to be a good corporate citizen through the lens of the NAACP, specifically as it relates to issues impacting people of color. So as Marvin pointed out, that's uh, supplier diversity programs, that's digital divide programs, that's diversity on boards and senior leadership, that's anti-discrimination, hiring, paying promotion practices. So once we craft sort of the priorities from a social standpoint, 
Um, Sustainalytics, who's our ESG research partner, uh, scores the public companies based off of those criteria, arrives at the top 200 scoring companies. And then Morningstar, as our index partner, creates a index that is designed to minimize tracking error to the broader market. So you've got your financial data with what we call social alpha. And uh, financial alpha is superior risk-adjusted returns. Social alpha is superior corporate social outcomes relative to your social and environmental priorities. Um, yeah. And, you know, yeah. there, and again, there are some... The Go ahead. Finish there, your are point. Some, there are there are some crossovers, and, and and mega caps are disproportionately represented because, frankly, they're the ones that are committing the resources, not only to having these programs in place, but also reporting on the programs. Um, and and it's a lack of transparency and data in a lot of cases, as that uh, ends up crafting um, who who actually gets in the index. Yeah. Uh, well, let me just. Talk about what goes in the index, because, uh, Ben, if Morningstar, you, you've got the, um, the Minority Empowerment Index. Uh, that's what we're using here. That provides exposure to U.S. companies that stand out there for their commitment to racial and ethnic diversity. Tell us about that index. Tell us about how you decide what goes in that. Uh, and is this part of a, a, a broader trend, particularly this ETF here we're talking about today, uh, more specific ETFs in the ESG spaces um, that address specific social issues rather than just rather broad ESGs, for example. Is, is there any trend here? Yeah, Bob. So, well, I'm coming at it from a research perspective, and, and my team's not directly involved with the manufacturing of the indexes. I, I think one of the key points that both Marvin and Ethan have touched on is, is data and data availability and the quality of, of data that is available to form the foundation of all of these ESG indexes, be they focused on a, a more narrow theme, as is the case with NACP, or be they broader spectrum ESG. There are inherent challenges in this space defining uh, what is success and, and what is failure, failure across all of these different criteria. And generally speaking, what you've seen is that among the 90 or so ESG ETFs that are out there today, there's really only a small handful that focus on more narrow spectrum social issues. So nine of the top 10 ESG ETFs right now account for about 70% of all the money that investors have put into these funds. And nine of those focus broadly on ES and G and look to balance as, as Ethan deemed it the financial beta, so investors want broad market exposure, but they want broad market exposure while also simultaneously trying to invest with those companies. They're going to make a dent across all three of those criteria, be they environmental, social, or governance related. Yeah. And we've seen real meaningful flows yeah. into all of these funds in, in recent years. And I think it's a trend that's only going to continue. And I think the data and the definitions are only going to get better with time. Yeah, that's part of the problem I have with all of this. The definitions are a little slippery. But, Ethan, you brought up a very good point. I keep asking, why are mega caps so, so strongly represented in these ESG funds? Your point was that uh, reporting, they do better reporting than everybody else than about what they're doing. And there's a certain lack of transparency when you get further down the food chain, I think. I think that's a very good point. What, if anything, and, and Marvin, this is addressed to you, can we, can we, what can we do to get companies be more transparent so we can measure this a little bit better? I, I keep complaining that part of ESG is a lot of this falls into what, what we call qualitative uh, research, which is very difficult to put numbers on, to quantify in a way. So it, it, Ethan and Marvin, both of you, take a shot at this. What can we do to increase transparency yeah, around but, these issues? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, I think it's important that uh, uh, we make the case that uh, by engaging with an organization like the NAACP and being more transparent about what's happening is going to sort of increase their opportunities in the market. Uh, yeah. It, well, oh. and it, 
of priorities. And I think that we are we, the the kind of engagement that's kind of resulted from this from this fund for us as the NAACP has resulted in companies wanting to talk more about what can we do to change, what can we do to improve in these areas around supplier diversity and recruiting uh, 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 more diverse candidates for C-suite opportunities. It's the engagement that has yeah. allowed uh, for improvement. Marvin, you were breaking up a little bit there, but I think we got the gist of what you were saying. E Ethan, you wanted to make a point, too? Yeah, and, and Bob, I think I would just echo what Marvin said, but um, what we're trying to do here is provide incentive for corporate America to report, um, because I think it's one thing to be in an ESG fund that is, that is trying to be all things to all people, because it's hard to communicate what that actually means. Um, it's a very different thing to be able to say, you know, we are in the NAACP Minority Empowerment Fund, because these are the... 10 things that the NAACP cares about, and we do a better job relative uh, to our competitors, right? So our goal is to have inclusion in this fund become a compelling point of differentiation for corporate America, and that's when it starts to justify the cost of compiling and reporting some of this data, because if not, yeah. um, you know, you're going to get left behind by your competition in a world that is increasingly difficult uh, to separate your products and services in. Yeah. Ben, this is a, a very slippery subject, but take a swing at it here. I mean, I, for, for me, social investing is the most difficult of the ESG to really define. It's pretty broad. I mean, what's the criteria that you're using? Is it how you treat minority employees, for example? Uh, is it how much money they donate to the social justice causes? Uh, is it how much uh, weighting should be given compared to other social issues or against environmental issues or against uh, uh, governance issues. Uh, you can get different outcomes. I, some companies um, will include oil companies in their ESG, uh, even though other companies consider uh, uh, oil companies not to be involved. Some people want oil companies that are the best ones doing the least polluting, for example. It's a, uh, I'm using a little environmental, but social is a really tough one to define. Well, Bob, I, I would argue they're all very tough to define, and, and really the devil's in the details. And you know, the details depend on the provider of the data, the supplier of the data in question. Uh, so it, it really is incumbent upon investors when they're looking at all of these different funds to, to dive into the specifics. And if they see an oil fund in the portfolio, you know, they might be scratching their head, but that might be one of the better actors among all of the different uh, oil producers that's out there. They might be investing at the margin to increase their exposure to clean energy and, and renewables. So, you know, it, it gets back to the fact that this is very definitionally dependent. For all intents and purposes, it's, it's a form of active management. It's an active construct. So investors need to know that every portfolio is going to be distinct, that it might get you various levels of, of ESG-ness from watered down to very potent and that you're going to get something different from the market over a long period of time. So, again, if, if we look at where the vast majority of money is now in these funds, it's invested in those funds that have the highest financial beta, right? So they look the most like the stock market, which explains why you have you know, a regular showing from all of the mega cap names that we all know so well. Uh, you know, that will continue to evolve over time. I think the choice in this space will continue to evolve over time because my ESG is not your ESG, is, is not the next guy down the road's ESG. It's uh, a very sort of personal topic. Um, so I, I think you're going to continue to see an evolution in the space and, and more and more choice, be it in terms of broad spectrum ESG or funds that focus on more narrow issues like NACP. Yeah, it's, it's always interesting that Occidental Petroleum always shows up in these ESG funds that include energy because it, by the criterion that are normally used, uh, particularly on environmental, Occidental does better against various metrics than most of its competitors. So there it is. And yet people say, why is Occidental there? And I say, well, they're less polluting. They're more environmentally friendly than their other competitors that are out there in the same space, essentially. Marvin, I'm going to give you the last word here. Um, of course, every investor wants to know, I want to do the right thing. I want to invest in socially responsible, socially just causes, but I also don't want to lose money. Have, have, have you been heartened at all? Or what's your reaction to uh, in, investors as we're, we're grappling with these issues of social justice? Do, do you see a real awakening? And I don't just mean on the 
on the uh, social front, I mean actually on the investing front, do you think that this could actually make a, uh, a, 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 a sea change, a real sea change in difference? ESG has already been moving in this direction, but that this could push it even further and more carefully define the boundaries of what constitutes ESG. Oh, I, I absolutely think so. And I think in the current environment where everyone is kind of trying to figure out how can I get involved, what can I do, um, capital has the power to make social change. And I think that theme is something that we're seeing get played out uh, as investors began to look. I mean, this has been more than more than 10 years now where investors were were, were making decisions on their investment based not, on, not only on returns, but on the quality of the companies that they were investing in by their commitments to sort of environmental issues. Now, the same thing is beginning to happen on social issues. And I think when it comes down to uh, investors influencing what's happening, I think the, the truth is it's, it's going to happen. I think the reality is investors are going to be able to push a process that, that results in real change on a social in, in social and social justice. And I think companies are getting the message as well, because as they really grapple with how to show up the right way in this moment, they're being challenged by the NAACP and other organizations to make sure that the rhetoric that they're using around uh, on making commitments, public commitments to stand against racial discrimination is actually getting played out and lived out in the way they do business internally. I think this is really a, a watershed moment, and I think we're, we're, we're just at the beginning of it. I think investors are going to be raising their voices in more powerful ways in the future around social issues. Yeah, I agree with you, uh, Marvin. I think this this sounds like something that actually is not something we do for a week and then the news cycle overtakes us. Th this has a feel of more permanence to it. I hope uh, that is the case. Long overdue. So uh, thank you. That's a very good point to end on. That does it for this week's ETF Edge, folks. I'm Bob Bassani. And my thanks, of course, to Marvin, to Ethan, and to Ben for joining us today. You can find all of our videos, all of our programs on our website, etfedge.cnbc.com. We'll see you next Monday, same time, same place. Everybody have a healthy, happy, and safe trading week. Get the ABCs of ETFs with the ETF Edge newsletter, your weekly update on the hottest trends in the nearly $4 trillion market of exchange-traded funds, expert analysis, actionable ideas, and exclusive insight from host Bob Pisani. Sign up now at cnbc.com forward slash ETF Edge newsletter.